Uh, hello guys, uh, welcome to our today's uh, podcast and today we have with us a special guest, it's uh, Scott Millard from a CEO of a company called Firdemic. Uh, they are a publisher uh, who works with horror games and he's going to talk a little bit about his career, a little bit about the way the games are distributed right now, how to get into publishing and how to work there and he's also going to share some tips for developers who want to publish their own game. Greetings, and welcome to the 80 Level Roundtable podcast. In each episode, host Kirill Tokarev invites video game industry leaders to talk about the world of game development. No topic is off limits as long as it relates to video game development. New episodes are in the works, so remember to follow us or subscribe and share with someone you know will also enjoy the podcast. I have a couple of questions for you, Scott, and uh, maybe we can start with like a little introduction. Yeah, yes. Uh, I mean, we can talk about Theodemic. Obviously, we can talk about, um, um, you know, my, my games career. And But I, I had this PowerPoint presentation that I, that I did ages and ages ago, and I certainly don't have it with me now, But um, and it was called Build Your Own Bethesda. <laughs> and it was kind of about how to make a uh, 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 a um, an independent game style. Yeah, tell us about that. Tell us about that. Well, it sounds amazing. Build Your Own Bethesda. It sounds amazing. Well, well yeah, because, I mean, you know, I suppose one of the things that a lot of people have kind of forgotten over the last few years is the value of publishing services. I mean, we talk to developers all the time about, um, you know, uh, you know, us publishing their game or looking at their game, and and we come across a lot of skepticism about it. And because I mean, you look at the end of the day, everyone can publish a game themselves. They can put it up on Steam, they can press release and off it goes. And so why would you want to share your your revenue with with, with a publisher? And um, but these uh, these publishing services are really really important and they're becoming even more important with uh, um, uh, uh, the barrier to entry to game development you know, becoming lower and lower and lower. And by that I mean, you know, the, the tools to make games are literally download and start and, and start making. I mean, you know, the Unreal Engine Unity is all uh, free. And so you can make a game relatively cheaply with just your time. Uh, and then it comes to publishing it on various different platforms, getting it out there, working it across the life cycle of that game. And uh, of course, you know, marketing it, marketing it, getting it in front of as many people as possible. And, um, you know, so, so all these things are really critically important. And one of the other um, things that, that I, I had come across last week was um, I had I spoken to many venture capitalists and they were all going, you know, no, 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 we're not interested in publishers. We're only interested in games as a service, and we're going to invest in those things. And that has been the story for the last, you know, perhaps, you know, two, three years. And, you know, millions and millions of dollars uh, have been invested in, you know, companies with only one IP. And those are starting to release now, and a lot of those are starting to release now. And I was speaking to a rather large venture capital company the other day, and he was saying, yeah, well, it's not panning out very well because, you know, People are taking taking these monster bets on one game, and so and when that game doesn't actually uh, uh, sell, um, you know, th th where do you go? I mean, there's no there's, there's no uh, uh, doubling up. But in the game of publishing, of course, you have uh, uh, grouped together titles, and you have a backstop should one of your games not do as you uh, as you expect. You can always move on to to another game, and that has always been. The, the business of publishing, whether it be movies, whether it be books, whether it be, uh, um, you know, games or, or music, uh, anything in entertainment, it was grouping products together to have uh, 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 and, and grouping those products together so that you could leverage the, the, the entire range of products to promote each individual product. Interesting. So funny you mentioned uh, Bethesda because my favorite story about Bethesda is when they released the Terminator game, and at the same time, its software released, uh, I think it was Doom. And at the, at the time, like, when they were compared and competing on the market, Doom obviously became this uh, cultural phenomenon. But at the end of the day, further down the line, Bethesda actually acquired its software and all the tech and all the brands and all the other. So that just goes for 
you know, publishing still wins <laughs> at the end of the day in, in, in some manner. Yeah, and I think, you know, more recently, I mean, and, and, and I mean, there's still a lot of skeptics out there saying, oh, look, publishing's an old business, but, you know, you have companies like Tiny Build um, and you know, Devolver, which have just both recently, in the, well, at least in the last like 18 months or so, uh, are listed on the AIM in, in the UK, and the valuations have been insane. Um, you know, simply because, you know, the, again, I mean, they're solid, it's a solid business model. Yes, it can go a bit wrong here and there, but, you know, you always have um, a, a catalog to fall back on uh, uh, should, you know, your primary or your big hit of that year not do so well. Um, but I mean, you know, so I suppose, and, and for, for, for smaller, you know, younger publishers, I mean, it's really, really important for them to sort of understand what it is that the publishers do. So perhaps we can, we can talk about that. So <laughs> tell, tell us about, uh, tell us a bit about uh, Feardemic, because before the, when I was preparing for the podcast, I kind of checked out the website and it was my understanding that you guys kind of specialize in a certain theme. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about this and uh, why this particular theme, what makes it so interesting and so on. Yeah, so, so essentially Feardemic is a publisher of video games and we publish across all platforms, PC, PlayStation 5, Series X, etc. And um, uh, we, we're a little different in that we specialize in a genre of horror. And, you know, when we say horror, um, when, I mean, one of the things about the games industry, which is pretty interesting, actually, is that, that we actually categorize genre by game mechanic as opposed to uh, uh, the narrative style. So when you see sort of adventure, first person shooter, all those types of things on, on a graph, uh, you, you're sort of struggling to find horror. And a lot of people sort of say to me, oh, you know, why, why are you doing horror? It's such a niche business. But actually, I mean, when you th consider uh, uh, the narrative as horror and then you look look at all the games that are sort of released every year, uh, almost about 30% of them, 30% of games would fall within this sort of uh, a vertical that we call horror. Low intensity horror all the way through to high intensity horror. And when I mean low intensity horror, I mean, you know, uh, um, you know, children's games like The Addams Family or even Piggy on Roblox. I mean, that is a horror narrative game, but it's aimed at kids. It's a low intensity. And then you've got, you know, the more high intensity games like, you know, Dark Fracture. And, uh, uh, um, you know, and, and this comes from this uh, idea of our founder, actually. And, and the company Fiademic was founded by another development studio called Bloober Team. And uh, uh, we are, and they're still our biggest shareholder. In fact, we're sort of, you know, in their office now. Um, but, uh, uh, and the thesis was to be the best in your your, your, your area, and they picked psychological horror. And so uh, Layers of Fear came, um, The Observer came, and they were all psychological horror games, and they became extremely good at them. And one of the things that, that Peter Babiano, the, the founder of uh, Bloober Team, sort of kind of wanted to do was take that experience that they had and the 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 IP that they sort of you know gathered around the sort of expertise of, in doing it and um, share that with uh, other developers around the world or small developers around the world that are perhaps doing their first or second game and this is where Feardemic comes in. So if you can imagine Bloober Team, they focus on you know their own creative creative projects, uh, whether it be their own created IPs or licensed IPs. Um, Feardemic. We do all the third-party publishing. We look for projects all over the world, and uh, whether they're in Los Angeles, whether they're in Israel, whether they're in here in Poland, and um, we invest in those projects uh, not only just with you know um, our cash, but our expertise as well. Um, given and, and you know Bloober's expertise, whether it be in sound design, whether it be in you know getting certain plugins to work, uh, we can provide that assistance to make sure that um, you know at the end of the day that developer is going to deliver a game that, that they want to deliver. You know, it's not, of course, you know, art is art. You know, it's not really always a given, especially with um, smaller smaller teams and you don't really know what you're going to get at the end. Um, and hence why, you know, it's great to sort of have a, 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 as wider catalog or larger catalog as you can um, to ensure that, you know, some of those, some of those games, you know, that, that actually get released actually make it uh, uh, to a wider audience. So, question um why horror like if you can talk from a publisher perspective in terms of um, 
you know, revenue, maybe sales numbers and so on. When you think about horror games, I think about games like maybe Bloodborne, maybe games like Resident Evil, right? Um, those kind of big titles. Silent Hill, a lot from Japan. Most of them are from Japan, that image, right? So those are super successful titles, like millions of copies sold. Um, but I was under the impression that it was more kind of, um, you know, like a one brand story or something like that, that it's not widespread. Mm, since you're doing this uh, in this work and in that genre, like tell us a little bit about the some of the numbers or maybe some of the just general trends there. Yeah. So, so um, you know, one of the, uh, the, the biggest platforms certainly to emerge out of um, the uh, 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 the pandemic was, you know, Roblox and, um, you know, Roblox were the darlings of everybody for in 20, 2021. And the, the biggest game that they had on their platform was a game called Piggy. That game is a horror game without any question. I mean, it is a low intensity horror game. Um, so uh, it, it is a very, very widely appreciated genre. Um, and I mean, as far as the size of the market goes, I mean, we think, I mean, again, the, you know, getting ex the exact data because the, the, the industry doesn't follow, uh, the games industry doesn't follow games by narrative style. They follow them by, you know, first person shooter, adventure game, simulator, those types of things. So, I mean, to do, um, there has been some sort of narrative, narrative sort of uh, 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 dissections that you can sort of overlay and then make some judgment. But I would say, and I th certainly, you know, the, the sort of watermark that we go on is that about thirteen point one billion uh, uh, billion dollars a year uh, in PC games and console games is generated from games that would fit within the um, uh, uh, within the vertical of horror to some degree. I mean. You know, the medium is primarily an adventure game, right? So, um, uh, uh, but it is really a horror game. So, um, uh, we, it, it's a substantial market. You know, it, it, it is almost, a, you know, a little under a third of all, you know, games produced are, you know, um, uh, have a narrative thread that would easily be translated as horror. Now, as to why horror, um, have you ever been to a Ramstein concert? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, if you if you sort of compare the sort of end user or the person that generally is interested in horror, they're not dissimilar to sort of people that are interested in to sort of, you know alternative alternative sort of music scene. They're, they're very they're they're very um, engaged. Uh, and and this is one thing that Bluebird team found out. And this was Peter. It was P Peter when I first met him. He's explaining this to me. He's saying, "Look, you know, they're really, really engaged." And what we found is when we actually, you know, produced la drop layers of fear, and and it started becoming a, a huge success. They're really interested in following what you're going to do next. They're really interested and engaged and open to what it is you're going to do next. And um, and what we've found over the past uh, uh, past couple of years, as we've built Fiademic, as we're we're starting to sort of build our own community, and um, you know it's 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 tough. You know, there's a lot of things out there distracting users, but you know it, it's much easier when you have a user base that has sort of like these common interests that you can sort of predict what they are. Um, it would be much harder, for example, trying to build an audience with general interests uh, that are interested in, say, for example, you know, cars. Everyone's interested in cars. So the more uh, uh, general those interests are, the harder they are to pinpoint, uh, especially across social media today. So um, from a perspective of being able to understand our audience and you know carrying that audience along with you from game to game you know horror is a much uh, a more sort of robust um, uh, um, robust, ro robust narrative style to use and you know look it's fun I mean who doesn't like to be scared yeah yeah I mean I have a question um, two rather um, so one of the big ones is who makes horror games right so if you look at some of those titles, you might think, I mean, what's going on there, right? But as you know, coming from the developer side and knowing a lot of developers, I know that I know the developers at Layers of Fear, for example. So we did an interview with them uh, a, a while back when the game was just uh, being released. <coughs> They're just like normal guys that work in the offices. They, the subject matter is this, right? The the ghost and stuff, but. Um, 
It would be nice since you are a publisher, if you could discuss a little bit about your partners, like who are the companies that you're working with? Is there some specific region where more horror games are being made? Is there something specific about these kind of teams, teams that you're that the partnering with that are building these kind of games? Um, it's really general. I mean, you know, there is horror fans all over the world. And I mean, and I think one of the things about Layers of Fear, you know, when it came out, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, Bloober team at that particular point in time was a small independent developer. They nowhere near as big as they are today. Um, they were quite small and they were known as an independent developer, a small independent developer. And they created this game um, uh, that sold or, you know, that, that, you know, has over, I think it's about five, three to five million users. I can't, rem I can't remember. It is a quite a large amount. Um, and it's not just a game that everyone played. It's a game or a game that launched Bloober Team. It really is a game that launched, you know, a million horror games because people saw, saw what you could do and how you could tell stories with uh, interactive projects, tell really interesting stories with not only just music and uh, um, uh, uh, filmed content, and but interactive content and, um, you know, you could really use it to find emotions and really drag emotions out of your users. And I think that is that is the sort of um, attraction of it is, is because it there's something else there in you that you don't present to anybody else that you can sort of in, uh, explore using the medium of a horror game in the safety of your own uh, in the safety of your own home. Um, it tells you as much about you as it does, you know, about um, uh, 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 whoever made the game. Um, and I, and I think that's what's really interesting about it. And you know, we all understand what it is to be scared. It's a basic human instinct and um you know if we can feel that we can control it with either a horror movie or a horror game i mean it, it's it's really kind of interesting and that's what people find it attractive and, and they find it attractive to make that type of product as well because the challenge is how can i provoke this emotion um uh in somebody else because i can't um provoke pain using a computer game because I don't want to, <laughs> um, you know, I can't really provoke love. It's, that's a really, you know, a hard thing to do for even the season, most seasoned storyteller. Um, but I can, I can, I think that I can produce that visceral reaction of fear. Um, so it, it is um, a, a vehicle for that. And I, and I really do think that's really the reason why people really enjoy it. I mean, most of our developers, you know, hey, they're just normal people. They go to work in an office, as you say, said. Um, you know, they're 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 interested in lots of different things. Some play classical music. Some, it, it, yeah, yeah. It's not that they're they're all uh, like Rammstein uh, fans and and so on. So, a question again, um, a little bit about development, and then I'm gonna switch to publishing and uh, distribution. So, there. There's this idea, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to say uh, in general, right? So it doesn't mean that it's true and you can maybe disillusion me or discuss it. So that <clears throat> some of these games, horror games, are cheaper to make. Uh, example, so if I want to do a stylized project <coughs> similar to, let's say, The Legend of Zelda, I need to have a lot of guys crafting content, creating visual effects, very time consuming because it's almost everything done by hand. You can't really automate it and all. But then when I build something like Amnesia, <clears throat> I create an environment. I create maybe one very gory, scary character that chases me. And then I just create spaces where I hide in the, you know, less time, smaller team, less money involved. Um, is this true now? Was it ever true or it's just the same budget, the same amount of time and it's not really, it doesn't really matter? Well, I mean, I, I don't think it's necessarily about the budget. Um, uh, 
as about the the creativity and the ability to actually use the tools in a way that can make someone scared. I mean, you know, there is a lot of um, you know interesting things out there that have been made on a low budget that are, are incredibly compelling and fun to 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 experience. Um, uh, so you know, it, it, I think you know, generally speaking, right. In the whole games industry, I think what is going to happen, and you know, certainly with the release of UE five, um, and uh, you know, we have we have talked internally about this, particularly with a lot of the game developers about you know that are thinking about okay, what's the new project going to be, and um, you know, a lot of them, you know, will say things like, well, all games are going to look beautiful within within five years. It'll be really hard to tell a game on a low budget from a game on a high budget because the plugins, the ray tracing, everything, the basic tools are there and they're all for free. And so everything is going to look beautiful. It's all really going to come down to your skill as a storyteller and as a game designer that's going to make the difference. So the actual art style, the assets and how it looks is not going to be as important uh, as as it has done in the past. You know, in the past, we all get excited about water or fire or something. Um, uh, whereas, whereas in the future, it's all going to look fantastic. So whether it's whether it's a game that costs you know, um, just someone's time or a, a game developed by, you know, uh, uh, 50 or 60 people, the real key is going to be in the storytelling. And that is um, uh, um, you know, the, the, that is the challenge for everybody. And it's not, it's certainly not dissimilar in, in the, in other, in, in other parts of the entertainment business as well. I mean, you know, again, um, you know, the cost of creating filmed content is not, you know, is, is not, uh, uh, it is quite cheap. Um, but you know, it comes down to the story that you can tell, how you can present it and the, um, the character that you can, you can portray. It's not, um, the quality of it. Uh, everything's fantastic now. <laughs> um, so it's, it, it really comes down to that sort of, that, that style and the quantity of, um, uh, of games that are on the market. I think it's like, you know, 19 games or you know, on average or 20 games every day get, you know, released on Steam. So that over a course of a year is a huge amount. Um, and, you know, the, the only way to overcome that is, you know, focusing on that sort of story and, you know, being able to take that, take the user on a, on a journey. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, the, you know, most amazing graphics or whatever. It just has to be engaging and it has to be a story that they want to care about. Scott, so l let's talk a little bit about the distribution. So I checked out your website. You actually have a a store there where you can go and buy different uh, games but this doesn't I, it doesn't seem like this is the only way that you're distributing your product no 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 not, not um, at all that, that to be honest that was an afterthought but <laughs> yeah I, I thought so so how um what are like the main channels where you're selling i know that probably steam is very big maybe switch maybe some other platforms it would be very nice if you could kind of explain how our games are being sold right now and where so so funny i think a very detailed um um discussion about this yesterday uh so essentially at the moment we sell directly on steam and we sell on playstation store the nintendo store and the xbox store um, this is where the customers are. This is um, where they buy games everywhere else, uh, in my opinion, is is kind of like um, uh, it's, it's a whole other discussion. Um, uh, what I have found surprising over the last couple of years is that um, uh, there is still an appetite for physical games, particularly on PlayStation. Now, um, uh, we last year we did a, a, a collector's edition of Dark, and doing a collection edition, a collector's edition of Dark, allowed us to put more in it and charge a higher price for it. It sold out um, uh, in as soon as it was announced. 
Um, and uh, that was, you know, on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5 and Switch. Now we're going to do it uh, uh, again, generally range it again now. We're just going to deal with Koch to range it um, uh, throughout all the main mainstream sort of, you know, uh, stores such as Media Market here in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, in Asia, in Australia, those types of places in electronic boutique. Because essentially at the end of the day, I mean, people are still going out and buying physical games. And, it, it, you know, surprisingly, I mean, a lot of my revenue has come from that uh, over the past 12 months as opposed to digital. So, you know, when it comes to sort of planning your, your game development and thinking about, okay, well, how am I going to sell it? At the end of the day, Steam is a really, really tough one because it's so noisy. It, there's a lot of uh, things going on there. There's a lot of choice all the time. There's a lot of, you know, discounting and, and, and price cutting. The platforms... Once you get from Steam to the, the PlayStation to Xbox, they become a little bit more curated, if you like, um, uh, because of the cost to get your 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 game on that platform. And um, when they're a little bit more curated, it's a little bit easier to find a customer that's willing to buy your 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 title. Um, so uh, you know, our experience is you know we love the plat we love those platforms, and you know we really focus our energy on those platforms. Um, you know, PC, and that's you know with Dark, for example, we don't do the PC distribution on that. Um, uh, uh, Unfold Games does it directly. We just do the consoles um, because it's you know a, a nice uh, uh, thing that we can do, and we are able to apply the skills that we've learned from Bloober Team, from all our own personal experience, and apply it to getting the game to the, the platforms and getting it well or getting it ported in, 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 in the best possible way. Scott, so to kind of talk a little bit about the role of the publisher, right? And you mentioned that uh, there's this um, situation where people are like, why are we sharing revenue with you? What are you bringing to the table? Um, you share it with Steam, you share it with a publisher, maybe with Walmart, then what are you left with, right? My question is like, what are the skills and the things that you bring that uh, ultimately help push more copies and make more money for the developer? Yeah, I think for, for a challenge, the, the, the challenge is for a developer is to understanding what um, uh, uh, what is required for them to make their game successful. And we see a lot, especially over the last couple of years, and you've had these sort of dedicated Steam sales where um, uh, people, you, you can put your unreleased game into that sale, whether it be, you know, PAX or whether it be, you know, Realms Deep or, or those types of things. And you can accumulate this huge amount of wish lists. And a, a lot of people go, oh, you know, I've got, you know, 70,000 wish lists, 60,000 wish lists. Why should I share that with you? I've done all the work. Um, and, but that's one part of it. That is just one one part, part of it. Having the, those wish lists there and then trying to convert them is something else. Because usually those wish lists, and uh, you know, they age. And, uh, you know, over the course of the development cycle, uh, two, three years, um, you know, the people that wish listed your game in, early on and may not be the ones that buy the game later on down the track. So it, it's it's a very complicated, complicated sort of um, uh, uh, um, process that you've got to put in place. So, number one, if we a publisher, um, uh, so it's separated into two things. First, right? there's the marketing, and then there's the technical side. So, let's just focus on the marketing for a second. A publisher should have a team of publishing uh, uh, of marketing staff, and that staff we have uh, now we have nine people, and that they handle everything from community to advertising to building assets to making. sure sure that, that um, you know, we uh, are mentioned everywhere from Reddit all the way through to, you know, all the Steam communities across all the different pages and they're all connected and we're all talking to all the people on Discord all the time. And we're doing that constantly so that the developers don't have to do that. And the longer that we do that, the more that we do that, the better we get at it. Um, you assume that companies like Devolver uh, uh, have a great deal of experience in that as 
do do we because we've been doing it a long long time and it's like practicing it's like practicing anything you know um uh you get better at it over time we have better relationships with media we have better relationships with uh influencers and we have better relationships with the platform holders because we are constantly talking to them and we're bringing them bringing them content um and that all has a huge value in greasing the wheels to get your game in front of people now um um you know, it, it's okay to go on Realms Deep and end up with 70,000 uh, um, uh, 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 wish lists, but what do you do with them? I mean, you know, who do you talk to at Microsoft? Who do you talk to at Sony? It's really hard to, uh, no matter how well you're financed, to go, well, I'm going to start a marketing department, I'm going to start it tomorrow, and they're just going to focus on my game. It, it's really difficult from that standing start to do that. And that's just all happening before release. Once you hit release, you suddenly are in the retail retailing business and, you know, retail, or retail customers don't sort of all rush out on one day and buy the game. You know, certainly some of them will, maybe 5% of your wish lists will or 7% of your wish lists. And then you've got to work that title over the next five years. And that means that you have to ensure that you can get it into boxes, you can get it into bundles, you can get it into sales. And it's constant, constant, constant. And uh, uh, that is sort of the, the, the job of a marketing department in a publishing company to make sure that you are not leaving uh, revenue on the table. You've got to look for it everywhere and you've got to consistently look for it. And you know, the, the general rule of thumb, if you're going to give anywhere between 50% and 30% of your revenue to a publisher, you've got to think, well, um, I'm going to over time at least sell twice as many or three times as many, at least, at the very least. Um, at, the, at best, their connections, their experience in delivering a game to the marketplace will you know, give me a better chance at converting my you know, lifetime work into a, 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 a hit. Um, you know, there's no guarantees, of course. It is a sort of a very fickle marketplace. But, um, uh, uh, you know, you got to give yourself as many chances as you can to find success. And, you know, that's what a marketing department and a publisher should do for you from a marketing point of view. From a technical point of view, of course, um, there is a lot of things that a publisher can offer as well. That last mile of localization, of porting, the QA support, all those things that you need to do. And, um, you know, uh, certainly a, um, uh, a publisher like Fiademic and our connection with Bloober team allows us to sort of, you know, get access to many um, services that perhaps a, a, a standalone solo developer is not going to get um, or not going to know where to look for them. Um, so, um, uh, so yeah, and, and you know, th those technical services, again, have a lot of value, whether it be just the porting expertise um, to the different platforms, knowing how to do all the certification processes and making sure that um, you can you can have good open dialogue with the platform holders and explore opportunities such as Game Pass, such as PlayStation Plus. All these types of things are really important to getting your game in front of as many people as possible. Scott, this is super interesting that you mentioned the platform holders and your experience working with Microsoft, Sony on uh, PlayStation and Xbox. And um, I have this question. So you mentioned that the market is very saturated. I mean, 20 games per day. There is so many games on like my PlayStation store. I can barely see what's coming out uh, apart from this. The, the front page, yeah. On Steam, it's just ridiculous. And if you go on... Uh, switch or anywhere kind of the discoverability process i would say it's uh <clears throat> still like in the middle ages somewhere right because the, there's basically no information apart from the name and this little icon or you know tile that you have with the so in this situation and these catalogs how do you improve discoverability like what are the tools that you have that help you, you know, especially with horror games, because they, it, it's difficult. That's what I'm saying. It, it's wildly difficult. I mean, it's difficult to predict um, anything these days with the, with you know, the way our digital lives are shaped. I mean, you can't sort of manufacture something going viral. A lot of the times, in our experience with Dark, has literally been, um, you know, it, 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 it 
has just been um, being patient, being um, consistent and, you know, just pushing and pushing and pushing all the time, you know, and, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, you know, Dark was released on PC in 2019, I think. Um, in late 2020, we released uh, the PS4 version and then PS5 and Series X followed in 2021. And uh, it wasn't until the final quarter of 2020, 2021 that... Um, uh, uh, you know, it sold the most copies. And even now today, this last quarter that's gone through, we've had a fan phenomenal run with it because people are still uh, are still discovering it. We One of the things that we did when we ported it is tried to make it as future-proof as possible by, you know, ensuring that it had haptic supports for the new, uh, the new consoles in it so that, you know, it felt, would always feel like a, a new game that it wouldn't date as fast. And, um, you know, I'm happy to say that that's kind of what's happened. Um, and, you know, just, just yesterday, it won the Webby Award for the People's Choice, uh, the People's Choice Webby Award for independent creation. Um, and, uh, you know, again, that's given it a whole lot of other uh, um, profiles in, in the press or around Twitter. I mean, I saw a lot of things being shared last night on, on, on Twitter in regards to Dark. Um, so, you know, it, it really is a, a marathon in some, in, in some respects. I mean, certainly even with Bloober Team's titles, they still continue to, to sell and they continue to promote them all the time and they continue to work those titles um, over time. And so, you know, it, if you just walk away from something as, uh, the, the day after you release it, like we used to do, um, you know, it... it, it it just won't work. You've really got to work it over time now. You've got to really focus on the life cycle of a product as opposed to the day one. It's interesting that you mentioned this and this, and this uh, multi-platform angle because I remember the first time I actually played uh, a game called Hollow Knight was on Switch and only later did I figure out that it was released several years <laughs> after it has been already released on PC and it was a huge hit there, but it blew up only when it went on a different platform. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that that's sort of happening more and more. I think Among Us was another game that, um, you know, it, 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 it took a while for it to find an audience. Um, you know, I think there's just so much going on out there in the world. There's so much content. And, you know, I, I was uh, reading a, well, I was listening to a podcast the other day, an expert on, um, you know, filmed entertainment. And he was talking about look, the, the top five streaming companies were investing $100, $130 billion in, uh, in content this year. There's just not enough credit cards in the world to pay for that. You know, it doesn't. There's just not enough subscribers to go around. Um, so not only is film content getting saturated, game content's getting saturated, everything's getting saturated. So you've got to be patient now. It's not a case of, um, you know, back in the day when we had Tekken. I mean, you know, it was all about the day one number and rolling it out um, or Dragon Ball or, or Skyrim. Now it doesn't work that way. We've had to rethink how we do this and how we approach it. And um, you, you have to sort of do it uh, uh, with a sort of a, a life cycle, product life cycle in mind as opposed to that day one number. So have a, let, let's go like a, a little bit in a different uh, street. We talk a lot on our podcast on how do you start in video game development, right? So where do you go? You can start as, you know, like a tester, then do something else or an artist. <coughs> But how do you start working as a, as a, in a publishing company? Like, what are like the entry points there and how you can, can you grow? Yeah, yeah. look, publishing, um, you, you, is it a different, it, it, is it a different mindset that you have to have when you go well, there? Well, yeah, I mean, game development is all about, uh, um, you, you, you know, finding, um, specialist, a group of specialists to provide uh, expertise as a group to create one product, whereas being a, a, a publisher is being more a generalist and knowing all the bits and pieces and how they all sort of sort of go together to affect an outcome. Uh, you have to know a little bit about game development and, and sort of who does what uh, so you, you can sort of understand how that product gets to, uh, gets to release stage. But, you know, if 
that there are you know the big publishers and there's a lot of consolidation going on at the moment and um you know interestingly enough um you know the, the publishers are you know at the top levels at the in the executive uh levels you know those people have been around for a while and um you know um some of them have been quite you know uh uh uh, famous others not so but um uh you know there, there 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 is a whole new generation of people that's sort of rolling through publishers at the moment and i think um you know it's it's a really fascinating you know area to be involved with and one of the things that makes it so attractive is the fact that uh you know every week you're dealing with a new product as opposed to a developer that has to develop the same product for five years straight um uh, i know a lot of people sort of kind of burn out you know um what one you know game number one's a big hit so they're immediately developing the sequel and you know five years later they're still developing the same game and they just want to you know throw the computer out the window um so uh, but you know the great thing about publishing and being involved in that side of the business is that you you are constantly dealing with new games all the time because you know publishing is about building a pipeline and uh you know the bigger the pipeline uh the more products you have going through through the more efficient that, that your your publisher will operate or will become the more practiced your marketing teams will become the better the relationships that you have with the platform holders the better the relationships you have with media and so on and so forth so uh it's a very very different type of um, uh, uh, experience than just working in game development and game development i mean you know there's a game development you know you can tell your own story and that's what it's that's what's great about it but with game publishing you get to help other people realize their dream of telling that story so and that's what it is being able to i mean i'm i'm the world's worst storyteller so i'm never going to make a game uh, uh, I'm never going to make a movie or write a book, but I can certainly help other people realize their dream in uh, bringing their story, bringing their, their, their world to, to market. So I want to ask you a little bit of a question that we kind of discussed with some representatives when we were talking about streamers. Um, and, you know, streamers right now is kind of like the one of the main avenues where you can spread the word about your game and uh, what they said is that they are very peculiar about the audience and they want to have offers that kind of cater to that audience so if i stream horror games <coughs> i want to sell with an affiliate link or something only horror games because that helps and it aligns with my audience um having kind of centered your attention attention at uh, horror in general as a genre does it help you sell more copies in in general does it help you kind of find that sweet spot and uh, push kind of more stuff out there or it doesn't really matter it's you, you just kind of like to work in this space Look, it, it is becoming ever more important, and I mean, we we see it just in. I mean, Dark Fracture is a game that um, is coming coming later. Um, you know, we haven't sort of announced the release date yet, but uh, uh, the demo, Dark Fracture Prologue, which is sort of the the story before the actual you know full game starts, is available now for free on on Steam, and we see it all the time. The wish lists going up and spiking and down and spiking, and every time they spike. We can almost certainly find a YouTuber that has um, uh, found it uh, and you know played it for his audience, and um, you know the, the the resulting interest that we get straight after that is just immediate. It's it's amazing, but you know one thing is is sort of clear to me is that it's really difficult for us to go out there and ask um, streamers to support our new game or play our new game because we don't necessarily understand their audience as um, as intimately as they do. Um, and, you know, um, what, what I've found is that, you know, if, if every time we have gone and sort of asked someone to play something new, they sort of, mm, you know, how much are you going to pay me to do it? Because, you know, I, I risk losing viewers if they turn on to my stream at night and don't see something that they know. 
Um, so it's kind of like a two-way street and it's a very, very difficult one. Um, uh, but you know, they are super important streamers. And, you know, but I think that the key is, you know, not to try and get them to uh, play your game or push your game is to try and think about how do you make content uh, that streamers would enjoy and that their audience will want to watch. That is the sort of kind of the key. And it goes back to the, what we were talking about before is, you know, that uh, if it, it's all about the narrative, the storytelling and the game, it doesn't matter um, about the, you know, the quality of the water or the reflections or the light uh, and the budget and how many people worked on it. It comes down to the story, the narrative style and the thought process that's gone into the game as to whether or not it's going to be something that streamers can use to engage their audiences with. Um, so, and, and, and this has been going on for, for, for ages. I mean, I, I remember in, in the start of my career, I was stationed in Korea and there was three TV channels at the time uh, broadcasting uh, computer games 24 hours a day. And that, it was all Warcraft, Warcraft and Warcraft and Starcraft. Um, and I remember going in to see them saying, look, um, you know, we had this game called Unreal Tournament <laughs> and it's going to be fantastic. We can make a TV show around it. And uh, uh, they just looked at me and said, mm, our audience likes StarCraft, you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, that was kind of, that was it. The, their audience liked StarCraft. They kept on playing StarCraft for the, for the, for the next 10 years um, because, you know, that, that's kind of the, the human condition. Uh, it's very hard to introduce them to new content. Um, and, and I see that with my kids as well, you know, that they're, they're, they're out watching streamers all the time and they will, will watch a streamer because he, they know what he's going to play. They don't want it see something new. They they just want to see what that stream is playing because they expect that's what they're going to get. Um, so it, it is a kind of really difficult one. And luckily, I mean, Dark Fracture Prologue has been out there for a couple of years now. And, um, you know, it... it, 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 it satisfies all the needs of uh, uh of um you know horror streamers in that it provides the jump scares and the, the detention and it's nice and it fits with their format um so so yeah they're all they they inevitably will will sort of add it to their repertoire and you know we'll see the result of that but you know other games that we've had and tried to go out and and push to get streamers to play it, you know, really hasn't kind of worked for us because at the end of the day, we don't know those streamers' uh, audiences and, you know, people are people and they don't really like to see new things. Um, they'd much prefer to see something that they, they're comfortable with and familiar with. Um, so it takes, it goes back to, again, the, 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 the long-term uh, strategy of, you know, um, uh, bringing a game to an audience. It's not all about day one anymore. It is a, a longer-term pursuit. Scott, so we're almost out of time, but I had like this last question kind of recommendation I hope you can give. Um, so if I'm a developer, <clears throat> I developed a premium title and I want to go to market. So what are the three things that I absolutely must do in order not to fail? Number one, don't get too overly ambitious um, because, you know, there is a lot, you can bite off a lot more than you can chew. Um, uh, and you'll be developing your first game for 10 years as opposed to, you know, one or two. So be conservative and be realistic about what you can do as a solo developer, or even if it's like three of you or four of you, be realistic about what it is that you can, that you can do and be thorough about setting your goals. So make your game design document and, and, and stick to it like glue. Don't let the, uh, let it drift. Um, uh, um, so, so that's number one. Number two, uh, if you're focusing on game development, um, think about adding a publisher to that mix. There are publishers out there that will help you. Um, but make sure you've got a good relationship with that publisher and you understand where they're coming from and um, how you fit with uh, uh, fit into their roster of games and you know how they're going to uh, uh, treat that game over a longer term. Um, so and number three, well, it has to be fun. If it's not fun, you know, if 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 you're not enjoying making it, 
no one's going to enjoy playing it. So, you know, it really does have to be, um, you know, a, a labor of love and something that you want to do rather than sort of something that you think you should be doing. All right, Scott, I think it was very inspiring. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, we'll leave the link to the description uh, in the description for the website so people can check out your catalog and maybe send your game. Thank you so much. Have a good Thanks, day. Thanks, Kirill. Thank you for having me. Thanks for enjoying another episode of the 80 Level Roundtable podcast. Check out upcoming episodes on the 80 Level website at 80.lv. Join our career site at 80.lv slash RFP. And share our podcast with friends and on your social networks.